Good Lord, ride all the way. A ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. This is Slu. Hi, I'm Bob Berman, and we are celebrating the full moon of March. It's a special full moon and a little less known than some of the other moons. I mean, everyone's heard of the harvest moon and the hunter's moon and the blood moon and the all sorts of even new names that have been conceived only in the last few years. But look at this. We've got some live views for you taken all around the world. That's what we do here at SLU. Our observatories are focused on the nearest object in space. Here's a, another live view of high magnification of the full worm moon. Now, yeah, okay, that doesn't have too much glamour associated with it, but there is a interesting etiology behind it, and it's a fascinating moon by itself. So not only are we using the SLU equipment to zoom in on it, and we're going to focus on that in the next half hour or so, but we'll also talk about the lore and legend and mythology. We're going to have uh, Tricia Ennis, our in-house expert on things like, oh, mythology and um, 
oddities associated with the moon. Now, the fact that this full moon is occurring just a few days from the equinox endows it with special supergirl powers. Yeah, I'm saying girl instead of uh, the usual masculine because in most cultures, the moon is associated with, um, with the female. You know, la luna, not la luna. And in, uh, if you go to the, the Latin countries, you're not going to find any in which the moon is, uh, is male, is masculine. So the full moon is being lit up as it always is by the sun shining straight down on its surface. As always, the full moon rises at sunset and it sets at sunrise and it's at its highest point in the sky when the sun is lowest below the horizon and that is midnight. At least it's usually midnight since we just started with the daylight saving time business uh, that shoves it up to uh, one o'clock in the morning. And while it's doing that, strange things will be happening. Oh, yes. First of all, if you're in a place that's clear tonight, city or countryside, doesn't matter. Look for the moon. It'll be out all night long. And right near it, the brightest star in the sky is floating not to Earth of the entire year. In fact, in several years. Just uh, earlier this month. And so um, we're only uh, less than a month from Jupiter's biggest, brightest, most interesting time to be seen. And you don't need star maps or any particular astronomy knowledge. I mean, we're here, of course, to share it together and to bring our equipment into the, uh, into the game and to help with all of this. But on your own, just go out, find the full moon, the star next to it, there's Jupiter, period. What's easier than that? They happen to be in adjoining constellations. Jupiter is in Leo the lion, and the full moon tonight is lurking in Virgo, just across the hallway there. And in fact, it's right near the star Beta Virginis, uh, normally the second brightest star in Virgo. And if you know the constellations a little bit, it forms the upper right side of the letter Y, which is what Virgo really looks like. You know, forget about trying to make out a, you know, a sexy Super Bowl halftime cheerleader or the traditional maiden or any of the rest. This is, uh, um, that's the star to look for. Jupiter's uh, not too far from it and the moon is almost touching it. So we have an interesting bunch of things going on. The fact that the full moon of March, third full moon of the year, uh, this year happens so close to the date of the equinox produces one more effect, and that is just as the sun on the equinox rises due east, sets due west, well, the moon, which is opposite the sun in the sky, the full moon is always opposite the sun, but the opposite this time means that it's doing the same thing. The full moon rose due east. It will set due west and sits directly over Earth's equator, just the way the sun did a few days ago on the equinox. So let's be clear about this. When you look at the moon tonight, you're looking at that spot in the sky that is hovering directly over our planet's equator. If you're a real stickler for detail, real kind of nerd, geeky person as I am, and some of our members here at SLU are, and love to get into the particulars, well, the moon is just less than a degree north of the precise celestial equator. But as this show goes on, and as the night goes on, it's going to slide south of that line. So yes, it's hovering right over the equator and it's going to cross it in the next few hours. So very cool stuff. Meanwhile, look at these live views of the moon. Very different full moon from any other phase because instead of the sunlight hitting the moon at an angle and lighting up craters and mountains in ways that let them pop at you and show relief, show detail, Instead of that, the illumination is straight down, 
Now, you can see this yourself using a flashlight. Don't do this during the show because, hey, you'll miss some of the show doing it. But afterward, grab a flashlight, turn off all the room lights, and point that flashlight straight at a wall. And the wall will look nice and flat. It will look like whoever the carpenter was who did the drywall or sheetrock or taping job. It'll look like he's the greatest in the world because it'll look perfectly flat and uh, just ideally perfect. Now put the flashlight flat against the wall so that the illumination is coming at an angle. In other words, you're illuminating the wall, not straight on, but as if you're lighting it up from the floor, looking along the wall. Now suddenly, everything changes. You, if there are any uh, little dimples in that wall material, any half-hidden nails, any bumps or jiggles, they'll all be immediately obvious. In other words, detail will spring to view. That's just what's happening with the moon tonight. We do not see the detail in terms of the stuff that has altitude. Instead, we see albedo features whites and blacks and grays that's what's popping into view and uh, the full moon is famous for presenting that look at this high magnification view this is our uh, one of our flagship telescopes on the canary islands and looking down at uh, some of the craters that are showing rays that are emanating from them that's because all craters on the moon were caused by meteors that hit the moon, most of them long ago. And some of the material from these impacts spread out and went in all sorts of directions. You can even tell how the meteor hit. You see, if the ray pattern, as we're looking at this live slew view right now, if the ray pattern is kind of symmetrical and all the lines are coming out of one of those white craters, in all directions, kind of evenly, it showed that the impact was straight down. But if you get a ray pattern, for example, the one on the left, and it looks like most of the rays are coming in one direction, and there are fewer in another direction, this is proof that the meteor struck the moon at an angle. So you can even tell the history of what's going on on the moon by looking at it, especially now at the time of the full moon. Now, the worm moon business, uh, we're doing that because different Native American tribes called each moon by a different name. We don't tend to do that. Uh, we Americans have only two names for the moon, the hunter's moon and the harvest moon, uh, the harvest being the closest one to the equinox of September, first day of fall, and the uh, hunter's moon being the first full moon after that. So typically the full moon of October. All of the other names are names that were used by various tribes. And, um, and so you got to pick which tribe you want to go along with. This one has a lot of validity to it, the full worm moon, because uh, number one, the Algonquins, pretty large tribe in the easternmost United States, uh, did call this the worm moon, the full worm moon, and so did the American colonists. So this, uh, this was kind of popular a few centuries ago, calling the third full moon of the year, the March full moon, the full worm moon. And of course, the reason for that is pretty obvious. The ground is starting to get unfrozen. Worms are showing up. Birds are showing up, uh, going after the worms. I don't know about you, but I saw my first robins just this past week, lighting on the uh, lighting on the ground, and uh, so wherever you're living, life is coming back. And one of the things that draws them are the worms. So uh, it, it sounded a little creepy at first, you know, worm moon. You know, why why do we even care about uh, calling this the, the the worm moon? We're looking at the crater Tycho here, near the southern part of the moon, and look at the ray system from from this one. This one is uh, uh, really BAM! Uh, it was so powerful that it threw rays, that is white lines, clear across the entire surface of the moon. The moon is 2,160 miles across, so if you think of one part of the moon, one edge of the moon being, let's say, in Boston, 
while the far other edge of the moon is in, let's say, Denver. So that's the size of the moon. And so imagine material, dust, debris being thrown from the impactor that created Tycho. And you can see the first beginnings of these lines. They're pretty much everywhere in this live, beautiful slew image. You know, all our images are color. And, uh, but as we're looking here, you can't honestly say that we're seeing any glorious colors. And we could have colorized it, of course, easy enough to do. Almost anybody uh, with any knowledge of uh, computer technology can just use a paint program and add colors to it. But the moon is one of the least colored objects in the known universe. Just so happens that what the surface is made of, which is mostly silicon, and we're talking about the stuff that mostly uh, composes sand, uh, you know, you go to the beach, beaches aren't filled with purples and oranges and things like that. Silicon is, uh, especially when it com combines with oxygen, as it did on the moon. So we have SiO2, combination of silicon and oxygen, and that's what most of the lunar surface is made of. Uh, the rest of it is other oxygen compounds, things like magnesium and aluminum oxide and oxides of all sorts of other materials. So much so that if you add it all up together, more than half of the moon is oxygen, just like more than half of you and I are oxygen. So essentially what we're doing here is we're, 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 we're this is oxygen. This is what, what this session is, is oxygen chatting about oxygen, you know, you and I talking about the moon, oxygen talking about more oxygen is what's going on. Here we're looking toward the middle of the moon. Maybe you can see a woman's face in profile, the famous uh, woman in the moon. It's not necessarily a sign of mental health to be able to easily pick this out. On the other hand, it's traditional. I'm not even going to try to draw that because, you know, people see all sorts of different features on it. Suffice to say that that very bright spot on the bottom is Tycho. We were looking at that using our other telescope a few moments ago. Now we're using yet another of our telescopes uh, here at SLU in the Canary Islands to uh, zoom in on the moon. And this is showing the pendant that the woman in the moon is wearing around her neck formed by Tycho, that crater. And look on the very, very bottom above the H in the word slew, and you'll see that's the crater, Tycho. And look at the rays coming up, starting, uh, let's say, in the 10 o'clock position from that. Also, there's some going straight up. Also, some uh, arising in the 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock position. Just rays emanating everywhere giving us a very dramatic, again, close-up of Tycho, giving us a dramatic uh, history lesson about how the moon used to be part of a violent solar system until about four billion years ago. It was the Wild West in these parts where debris from the formation of the solar system was pounding Earth and pounding the moon and uh, changing the topography of everything. Now it's all slowed down, and the lava that once flowed on the moon that formed those dark blotches that early astronomers, including Galileo, called seas. Well, in Latin, it's uh, maria, uh, or a single one is a mare, and they thought they were looking at oceans. Now we know that they're just smooth areas of solidified lava. Look at all of them. The side of the moon facing us is covered with them, and the side of the moon away from us has almost none at all. So the moon is almost like two different worlds, depending upon whether we're talking about the hemisphere that forever faces Earth versus the one that forever faces away. I know it's common misconception that there's a dark side of the moon, but there is not. All, all parts of the moon get two weeks of day and then two weeks of night. But there is a far side and a near side. The near side shows these dark areas a lot. 
whereas the far side has almost none of them. So it's really like a tale of two cities, two entire worlds. Well, uh, you know, we're going to get back to the science of the moon, but there are so many other aspects to this very cool worm moon that I'd love to for us to go to uh, Tricia Ennis uh, to talk about a very different aspect of the moon. So let's do that, and I'll, I'll come back a little bit later, but uh, I always love what Trish has to say because uh, it's so different and it's so enlightening as to what's going on with the moon. So Trish, if you're, if you're there, take it away. Hello, my name is Trisha Ennis. I am a cultural correspondent of sorts here at SLU, and today I'm here to talk to you about springtime. Now, spring is an important time of year to nearly every religion and culture on Earth down through the ages. As the snow melts, the birds return, animals come out of hibernation, and plants begin to grow again, we enter into a world of rebirth and renewal. Christians have Easter, pagans, Astara, there's the Jewish festival of Passover, and Nowruz, the Iranian New Year, among many, many others. Even though these different celebrations and feast days come from a wide variety of cultures and originated in different places and times, they all have their heart in the spirit of new beginnings, which is what makes the moon such a perfect backdrop on which to discuss them. With its constant monthly cycle, the moon is an ever-present symbol of rebirth as it cycles from new to full and back again. One of the things we've been focusing on here with these full moon shows are not only the names that have been given to these moons, but also the cultures which have done the naming. As the majority of them have come from Native American cultures, it has provided us a way to delve into the mythology, history, and culture of the many different tribes of North America, groups of people whose beliefs, lifestyles, and oral traditions are so strongly attached to the changing world around them. Tonight's full moon was so named, it's the full worm moon, because it marked the time of year when the snow began to melt and the earthworms would rise up out of the dirt, returning the telltale springtime birds to the northern skies. A bird is also one of the most important figures in Native American iconography, in this case, the thunderbird. In Lakota tradition, the thunderbird is said to return each spring, bringing with it migrating animals and the growth of plants and flowers, but they also bring turbulent storms. These two opposing forces, creation and destruction, are characteristic of the mythic creatures who were said to have the power to give life and to take it away. Their wings were said to bring the crash of lightning and thunder as they flapped, and to be so wide they would gather storm clouds. They could kill with winds and flooding rains or burn with lightning, but those rain clouds could also bring renewal to the earth. Thunderbirds were said to be able to take human form, and a group of them were said to have permanently disguised themselves as humans, come to earth, and created families among the native peoples. They lived in peace for generations until a group of humans forgot who they were and took the families as slaves. That's when the Thunderbirds returned to their true forms and sought their revenge on their captors. In some Native American traditions, thunderbirds who could not be properly seen or understood by mere mortals would come to certain worthy men during a dream, turning the person into an upside-down, hot-cold, forward-backward man. This would give the men certain power, but such power was dangerous and you couldn't stay this way for long. Dreams, too, were important in Native American lore, as another story tells of how springtime is when boys of a certain age were sent on a dream fast. In the myth, a boy named Opichi is sent on a dream fast by his father, who is convinced that the fast will bring his son great power and visions. He's so convinced of the power that this fast will bring that he sends his son into the forest too early, before the snow has left the ground. Each morning, the father asks his son to tell him what visions have appeared to him, and each day he sends him back into the forest to await something greater. After seven days, the father finally goes into the forest to allow his son to return home, but when he reaches his son's tent, he's not there. Instead, a small brown and red bird, a robin, flies out of the tent and tells the father that because he sent his son out too, on his fast too early and left him for too long, he's gone. 
Instead, the bird will now appear at the start of each spring to let other parents know when it is safe to send their sons on their own dream fast and to warn them not to leave their children too long. The robin has long been a harbinger of the spring season for folks living in the northern part of the United States, in part because robins return to this area when the weather warms and the earthworms rise from the dirt. The very same earthworms whose reappearance is marked by the full worm moon. Bob, back to you. Love this stuff. This is Trish. Thank you so much. That's Trisha Ennis, who's a material boy. I would trade the stuff that I say, you know, this uh, technical astronomy stuff for, I could listen to Trish uh, uh, all night long. It's just amazing stuff. That was a weird looking robin in that photograph. I guess robins can look like that, but, uh, uh, you know, the whole idea that there is this tie-in between the various moons, especially the full moons, and what's going on on the Earth below is, uh, well, that's one of the reasons why the names um, persist and why they're not, you know, as silly or purely mythological as we might think. Now, I haven't memorized that, of course, the, because there are so many different North American tribes with different names. And just here in March, for example, uh, some of the tribes, there was the wind, strong moon, the big clouds moon, the little sandstorm moon, just giving you some of the other names that were besides the full worm moon. But the, again, the worm moon was the one used by the colonials and used by the Algonquins. So it had more people it had more popularity than in any other name. So, you know, there's validity there. Next month when we get to the moon, uh, boy, there's uh, we're almost exploding with wild names, some of them being very normal sounding like the Cheyenne called uh, the April moon, the fourth moon of the year, the spring moon. Okay, fair enough. But another tribe called it the do-nothing moon. That's got to win some kind of prize. The do-nothing moon. Well, you know, in a way, you can be a SLU member and uh, come close to do nothing and yet still enjoy the universe because uh, I know this sounds like a plug. Believe it or not, this is not scheduled in the program for me to, to push this. I just love SLU. You know, I've been involved with it since uh, the beginning. And as I watch our membership grow and the people enjoying it and the giant telescopes and just the idea of commanding a telescope while you're just sitting at home in front of your computer in your underwear if you want you know no formality you don't have to worry about the weather you don't have to worry about it being uh city lights that are blocking out the views you can still see the faintest galaxies and detail in them and just make the telescope point wherever you want, even though it's more than a continent away. And uh, I, I just think that's just so cool. So what we do on the nights of the full moon, of course, that becomes our focus, the nearest object in the universe to us, meaning that if you could travel at the speed of light, and light, despite its fast speed, um, still requires a whole second to go around the earth eight and a half times. I mean, it's amazing how fast it is. So we use the speed of light as a idea of how far away things are. The closest star that's out these nights, for those of us who live in the Northern Hemisphere, um, is the dog star, Sirius. You can follow Orion's belt down and to the left to the dog star. It's eight 0.65 light years away, about eight and a half light years away, meaning that that's how long it took its light to reach us, eight and a half years. But when we talk about the moon, the light took one and a half seconds to reach us. So we could say that the moon is one and a half light seconds away, and we can use that fact to keep determining its distance. Fortunately, three of the Apollo astronaut teams, you know, we had six sets of uh, two-man crews, plus there was always a third guy orbiting around, uh, making sure everything was safe, orbiting above the moon, but six sets of 
two-man crews who went to the surface between 1969 and 1972, and three of those teams left behind corner cubes on the moon. This was one of my favorite of the things that they did. Corner cube is a little like those highway signs that uh, as you drive, if you put on your bright beams of your car, suddenly you'll see the highway sign get brighter itself, showing you that it's reflecting the light from your headlights perfectly. The little beads, glass beads, or whatever the material is being used these days, are designed in such a way that it will reflect light back toward the source, the source being your car's headlight. Well, same thing with the corner cubes. They're precisely designed to reflect light back to where it came from. And so the three different sets, one in particular was uh, particularly large, means that anybody with the right equipment and Observatories do that. There's one in Texas that in particular has an obsession with measuring the moon's distance by this method. So you shine a pulse of laser light in the correct direction. And even though only about one out of every million photons of light manage to hit the corner cube, that's because even though laser light is pretty concentrated, it still spreads out. I don't think many people are aware of this, but a laser, when it hits the moon, has a spot that's one mile wide. And uh, one mile on the moon, well, that's enough to see, certainly, but that means the tiny little laser cube, only a few inches across, is only going to receive the smallest percentage of the laser light that's coming toward the moon one photon out of a million. And then that gets reflected back, and out of those, only one in a million get received by the telescope back on Earth that's looking for it. So this is an easy stuff, especially when you're only starting out with a few watts of energy. Nonetheless, it's being done all the time. And by measuring the round-trip travel time from here to the moon, and back again, we can tell the moon's distance very precisely. And this is what lets us know that the moon is spiraling away from us. We're losing it. It's going away from us at the rate of one and a half inches a year. And that's because of a complex minuet, a dance that's being played between Earth and the moon. You know how we're slowing down. Earth's day is getting longer. That's because the moon is pulling on the, uh, well, it pulls on not just the oceans, but the, the ground as well. But the oceans hitting the beaches are causing a torque, a slowing down of Earth's rotation, so that after 700 centuries, the day is a second longer. That's not much. Imagine that, only a day longer in 700 centuries, not much at all. But it's something, and energy is never wasted in the universe. So that loss of energy as Earth slows its spin, that energy is gained by the moon. It gets the energy we lose. And what does it do with it? It spirals away from us. It uses it to climb to a higher orbit, which means that the the month, the time it takes the moon to go around us, which currently is 27.32166 days, is lengthening and eventually will be 40 days long. So the moon is getting smaller in the sky as it's going farther and farther away from us as part of the process of slowing down the Earth in its uh, spin. So the two of us are linked, and we know this precisely by those corner cubes left behind by the Apollo teams. One of the many proofs, in case you happen to know anyone who denies that we went to the moon, you know that silly talk, started with the movie Capricorn 1, was it? I think the idea that uh, it was all stage, it was a Hollywood uh, thing and that we never actually went to the moon. My simplest answer to people who say that is, well, many of us watched some of those uh, 
uh, takeoffs from the moon, watch the actual launches of the uh, Saturn V spacecraft that took us uh, to the moon. And if we didn't go to the moon, where were those spacecraft going? But that's the easiest question to ask anybody who actually believes in that paranoid stuff. Just say, where did the rocket go? And, you know, you'll be surprised at how they have no answer for that. It's like they've never thought about it. They go, uh, well, maybe it just orbited Earth. No, no, that wouldn't work because anything orbiting Earth is visible in the sky. Plus, we had lots of enemies back then, the Chinese and the Russians who had radar and would have been very happy to blab to the world that the rocket never went anywhere except orbited the Earth. So, yes, we went to the moon. We left behind the laser cubes. We are showing you this full moon, the third full moon of the year, the full worm moon, as it's been called by a number of the uh, ancient peoples no longer around with us. And using our giant slew telescopes, we've been watching it tonight. I want to remind you to look at the moon if you have clear skies tonight, and that bright star right next to it is the planet Jupiter. And uh, the two of them form quite a nice association in adjacent constellations. The moon is in Virgo tonight, and Jupiter is in the constellation of Leo the Lion, and the full moon is standing right above Earth's equator. So if you happen to have any friends in, let's say, Quito, uh, Ecuador, capital of Ecuador, uh, anybody who lives right on the equator, tell them, look straight up, and that's where they're going to see the moon when the moon reaches its highest point at one in the morning local time tonight. So it's a very special moon that we uh, have at the time of the equinox. We could call this the equinoctal full moon, but we're using the ancient terms, the full worm moon. We're watching it live here using the slew telescopes. Make sure you go outside and have a look yourself just with the naked eye because that's very cool. We're going to keep doing this and uh, more shows coming up two nights from now. We're going to look at the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, the famous star group, most famous star group of all because it has its own legend and lore and amazing science surrounding it. And it's very prominent at this time of year. So we'll use the SLU telescopes to focus in on that wonderful cluster. Again, another naked eye spectacle that you can see easily without any kind of equipment, but which the SLU telescopes zoom in and give you extra super cool views of. So hope you enjoy this and all of the uh, the science and the legend and all the rest that surrounds this live show here at SLU of the full worm moon, the third full moon of the year. Thanks for joining us for SLU. I'm Bob Berman. Good night.
10. 9. 8. 7. 6. 5. 4. 3. 2. 1. This is Slu. Hi, I'm Bob Berman, and we are celebrating the full moon of March. It's a special full moon and a little less known than some of the other moons. I mean, everyone's heard of the harvest moon and the hunter's moon and the blood moon and the all sorts of even new names that have been conceived only in the last few years. But look at this. We've got some live views for you taken all around the world. That's what we do here at SLU. Our observatories are focused on the nearest object in space. Here's a, another live view, a high magnification of the full worm moon. Now, yeah, okay, that doesn't have too much glamour associated with it, but there is a interesting etiology behind it, and it's a fascinating moon by itself. So not only are we using the SLU equipment to zoom in on it, and we're going to focus on that in the next half hour or so, but we'll also talk about the lore and legend and mythology. We're going to have uh, Tricia Ennis, our in-house expert on things like, oh, mythology and um, oddities associated with the moon. Now, the fact that this full moon is occurring just a few days from the equinox endows it with special supergirl powers. Yeah, I'm saying girl instead of uh, the usual masculine because in most cultures, the moon is associated with, um, with the female. You know, la luna, not la luna. And in, uh, if you go to the, the Latin countries, you're not going to find any in which the moon is, uh, is male, is masculine. So the full moon... It's being lit up, as it always is, by the sun shining straight down on its surface. As always, the full moon rises at sunset, and it sets at sunrise, and it's at its highest point in the sky when the sun is lowest below the horizon, and that is midnight. At least it's usually midnight, since we just started with the daylight saving time business uh, that shoves it up to...
Good Lord, ride all 